Hi there, it's Brian Sebastian. Movie reviews and more. Women on TV. TV Worldwide TV Network. I Team Two Four Seven out of Franklin, Tennessee. iHeart Radio and all the platforms around the world. And yes, I'm back in the guest bedroom. It's too noisy outside, so I had to do it this way. We make it do still until we get back into our full regiment of everything. So this is a special show. Ken, who are you and where are you coming from? Because you have a very impressive background. Well, thank you. Hi, Brian. I'm Ken Carlton. And uh, I suppose I most identify as a writer coming to you from New York City today in Chelsea. And in my current incarnation, I'm the founder, editor-in-chief, and chief bottle washer of Beyondish, which is a brand new food review and storytelling website that we started up about a year ago. But prior to that, I'm a screenwriter, a speechwriter, a novelist, an author. Um, it's hard to think of anything I haven't written about. And uh, whenever I think about the screenwriting piece, uh, long ago, I had a film deal with the producers of Babette's Feast, the original food porn movie. And uh, we worked on a film for a couple of years. And I make my home base here in New York. I split my time between New York and Chicago. And... Uh, have lived everywhere and a dozen years in LA in the film and TV business, but today it's food, food, and more food. Talk about this. Talk about what it was like to be that writer locked down. Probably didn't see it coming, but perfect time for a writer, <laughs> but mentally yeah. playing with your head. And at the same time, perfect time to create new recipes and write about stuff, but you can't go to a restaurant. You couldn't travel. Start there. What was that like for you? Well, there's nothing like starting a food review business and then a month after having every restaurant in America close. Um, we wouldn't call that great news, but I'm sort of an optimist. And uh, it, it changed from a business standpoint. It, it changed our focus a little bit. We originally came out of the gate thinking road warriors, business travelers, and we're going to review every restaurant in America. Uh, I'm very engaged in food and restaurants. One of my best friends is a chef. I wrote a memoir, memoir with them about uh, the Waverly Inn in New York, Braden Carter's place. So a lot of empathy for the people in food, especially here in New York. Yeah. A lot of jobs lost, uh, you know, not just in restaurants, but in conferences and events, and anywhere where people prepare food. But now you asked about writers. I, I still stay very in touch with my writer side. It, it's been an interesting time. I find, you know, through various social media, which I spend way too much time on, it's been a lot of pain for writers. Uh, for me, because I started a company, no, discipline mattered. You know, I had to get up every day and write and keep writing and write some more. My novelist friends, a lot of them, I think they kind of cranked to a halt because we just didn't know what was happening. And it was, it's, it's like uh, being handed a very large bowl of candy. You know, now you can eat it all. Do you necessarily want to? Is it as tasty when you can just keep scooping it up all day? So I, I know for me, the, the novel writing got harder and harder and that's not my principal thing these days. It's not my main jam. The ideas are good. You, you start with a lot of great ideas every day. But sitting down and executing when the world's grinding to a halt, I'm speaking only for me, I think, but I've heard others say it. Suddenly the, the fiction felt a little less important and the nonfiction felt a lot more important that you can separate out those. Very, very so, interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of authors around the world now, and a lot of them, a lot of first time authors were able to do a book, which was interesting. But I was thinking about those screenwriters who always wanted to have the time where in, back in the day, as you know, you go to the Beverly Hills Hotel and went, go to one of the bungalows so you could write in peace and quiet. <laughs> and then and for those gamers, this would have been a thing where I just want to be alone by myself and play my games. Well, you got your time for the writers and the gamers except they didn't forget, they, they forgot to include that they were gonna be locked down with a significant other. So they weren't gonna be by themselves, but they had times to write and play games. Talk about that aspect, you know, when you have your wife and then some people had a girlfriend and all of a sudden they realized, I don't like this person. That was really <laughs> these things to be stuck with someone that you thought you liked them. Like, nope, I don't think I wanna be with you. 
Talk about that aspect of things. Well, well, first of all, uh, you know, my background is, is so varied. I left out a big piece, which was I, I've been a relationship writer for a very big chunk of my life. I somehow always, and I, I wrote the His Point of View column for Helen Gurley Brown at Cosmo for a bunch of years. And wow. a lot of my fiction is relationship based, but I, I have what I guess is the best or worst relationship you can have in a pandemic and that my wife lives in Chicago and I live in Brooklyn. Wow. So, so we did not kill each other. Quite the contrary. We missed the heck out of each other. And uh, our kids are, are, are all off to school. She's got a couple of dogs, at least. Uh, just me and my Brooklyn apartment. So we did not kill each other. In fact, we did not see each other from March 12th until Memorial Day. Wow. Uh, however, living in New York, where everyone is piled on top of each other, I, I would say it was quite the litmus test on relationships. You know, the, the one that cracks me up is that people are suddenly discovering they can't stand the way their partner chews. Because, <laughs> you know, you're, you're sitting here, you know, we all got 400 square feet in New York, and that's the wealthy, lucky ones. At least I don't have a roommate. But um, it, it, it seemed like a little too much closeness, if you ask me. And you throw in the homeschooling kids and... Uh, all the weird noises that come from an apartment building you didn't know existed because you're not in yeah. your apartment building all day. I've not worked at home since my kids were born. I'm a get out the door kind of guy. No, no fuzzy slippers for me. So I, I think it's very challenging, but I, I had this benefit of, I've been commuting for 15 years in my marriage. So we are used to the distance. Talk about why Beyond Dish is very, very important, especially coming back with everything. It's because you can actually lead a lot of people to where they need to go on maybe new and upcoming restaurants, but actually at the same time, uh, cause I've talked to a bunch of my chef friends on the healthy eating side and the fitness side, uh, more delivery, more meal prep, uh, what people need because everybody had that COVID weight on them. Talk about those aspects of stuff because it still is a perfect time for you. We don't have to talk about my COVID weight, do we? I can't wait to go back to the gym. I have not set foot in the gym in a year. Not good. Um, yeah, it, it, originally we thought we we're going to be helping every business traveler. And uh, having spent a couple of years in a restaurant writing a memoir with a chef, so many people affected. And, um, you know, what, what we're trying to do and are, are beginning to do it beyond this, because we really are brand new, you know, a year old, just out of the gate. This is an amazing opportunity to help people in the food community. So the, the basic gig we have here is we, we have writers and photographers who love food who are doing our reviews. We, we do not pay for reviews. You know, we throw you your social media, we put it all up. So what it really is, is it's a chance for people to have a passion play about their local restaurant, because that's what we're all about is local. You know, we're, in fact, we're not in New York City and LA yet because the marketplace is so huge there. The competition is crazy. We're in places like Charlotte and San Diego and Lexing, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So this is a chance if you're a young writer who's just breaking out in food and you take a good picture and you want to support the guy down the street or the woman down the street who's doing an incredible macaroni and cheese and maybe she lost her job as a sous chef in a restaurant or a chef or maybe they're only open for takeout. I'm sure I know you're very well traveled. You have your favorite dish. Everyone has their favorite dish. This is an opportunity with one click on your phone to rave about that dish. And we put it up there and we do the social and we publicize it so that people will know if you're um, flying into Orlando and you're looking for that fantastic uh, veggie bean burger, someone just wrote about that. And it's very short. You know, there are a lot of food websites out there. Lord knows there's too much food writing in the world. You get this in one screen, one picture, one paragraph. So if you're in Orlando next week and you're looking for something, as our group grows, you go look for literally what you're in the mood for. You know, uh, fish tacos in San Diego. In time, we will have everyone's favorite fish taco. And these people, they've been vetted and they're identifiable. It's not group source, it's not Yelp. It is literally person A wrote about this dish, they stand by it, and you can look at their social media. You can see their personal website. So if you think the dish is no good, you, you know who to talk to. 
except we don't do snarky reviews and we don't do bad reviews. We are not about hurting people. And especially right. in this, this time where the food people so need our support, we're, we're only running good reviews. If you like something, we want to hear about it. If you're raving about it to your friends, please come rave with us. We will give you an opportunity. I like that because I, I did the same thing for movie reviews and more. There was always enough people to talk about a bad film. You know, so we created the system called the four E's, you know, uh, it could go for food, it could go for CD, you know, um, music, you know, if it's engaging, if it's exciting, if it's entertaining, you know, it's emotionally, you know, whatever the fact may be. And then if it was bad, I would just say it's, it's empty, you know, and I didn't have to say that because it's enough people to say bad things. We didn't want to do that either. We're here to support those small mom and pop businesses, whether it's environmentally friendly, sustainable, same thing on the food side of stuff, you know, on the healthy eating, because the 13 co-hosts I have, they're all women. We are all into eating healthy. You know, uh, some of them are vegan, some of them are vegetarians. There's a difference. Um, somewhere in the world of actually performing on stage. So they have to always eat clean. They have a cheat day, which, you know, our Friday, mm -hmm. uh, we call it fish fit fashion Friday day, which would mean that would be the cheat, cheat day on the fitness side. We could actually see our friends eating Dunkin' Donuts or something like that, something that you would never see them eat. And I wanted to make that, uh, the, that would be interesting to see. So it was like, yes, they like to have and indulge in something too. Going back to where, if they're, when they're traveling after their, their show, they just want to have something that might be fat. <laughs> or <laughs> they talked about vodka. I didn't know that vodka is the choice of their drink because it doesn't have any calories in it. I didn't know that. So I chose a vodka brand to come on to be a, one of our sponsors. And it was because of the girls. So I think your magazine will be very good. I, I'm not calling it a magazine because it's more than that. I can see where you want to take it. And I think that's a great idea. That's funny you bring that up because you know, I'm old school. I was also a magazine editor for many, many years, including of the, the infamous TV game show magazine. I actually, there was a TV game show magazine. And, and in fact, that's interesting. My chef friend who um, I wrote that book with, he was the head of sales and I was the editor in chief. And we drove that magazine to its knees. But we got nine magazines out. This is back in, I guess, the mid 90s, back when Pat and Vanna and Alex, may he rest in peace, and everyone was a big, big deal. And uh, um, we, we just felt when we did that magazine that it would be something special, and it wasn't. So he went out and became a chef, and I became a writer. That's how I ended up in Los Angeles. But um, interesting point about the vodka. You've just given me a valuable life lesson. I did not know it was your low calorie solution. Yeah, it was, you know, the one thing that we miss is the gifting suite. So I always went after those companies that spent a lot of money at gifting suites. So I chose them sort of like my sign. I want, you know, when I walked to red carpets with the girls, I wanted their brands to shine for movie reviews and more. The more is more important than the movie reviews. And that's how I created it back in October of 1993. So mm -hmm. unique things, and I love anything that's environmentally friendly, sustainable. I want net zero stuff on our property. It's those things that people aren't doing them. Well, they all tend to be small mom and pop businesses. So I want to help them survive when it comes to things like that. It's very, very important. And eating is a great thing on our acres. And you'll like this and you'll be invited out. Well, we have 10 acres that we're building up, which is just for growing our own fruit. It's never had any fracking in the soil. It's never had a fire on it. And it's never, um, um, the soil is rich and friendly. Uh, you know, it's gotta be alive. As you know, food has gotta be alive. And just like water, it's gotta be alive. And people don't think about these things. And we have all these things on our ranch that we're building up. And that's why it's called the Dreamweaver Artist Ranch. So stuff like what you've created, yeah, you, this will be fun for you because we have these chefs coming in. I have one from Chicago, uh, Katie O'Reilly, your, your your wife may know about her. She's coming in. I have Chef Rush, who was the White House chef for 23 years. He's a yeah. black guy in the, in the world of fitness, but he is that military chef. He's one of our uh, chefs and friends. So this would be really, really good. And then I have, um, um, her name is Veronica. I just met her last week, uh, Villanova. She was given six months to live. She was a Cordon Bleu chef from Paris, a single mom of three, went through a bad relationship. And she ended up turning everything around and then she created Alive, Well, and Thrive. So she's come on on us because she helps people who have come down with sicknesses, specifically anybody who had cancer. So she makes the food, 
but also puts that food that's good for you to healthy if you've had any ailments in her CBD products. And she's the only one woman that has that. So it makes it quite interesting. Oh, I love that. And, you know, we have a, a journalistic piece. And, and, you know, we're not a magazine. Obviously, we're a digital platform and a website, but we think like a magazine. I've got a lot of old time magazine people here. So we have a, a section along with the reviews called On the Dish. So I'll, I'll follow up with you after this. We write about people exactly like that who have got this passion for food. And that's and those short stories that I guess our format really is short. And people's attention span isn't what it used to be. And these have been really tough times. So people have really fantastic food stories. And one of my favorites, uh, we, we uncovered a, a beekeeper in Vermont whose honey is being used to create a special brand of gin. I think it's Bar Hill Gin in Vermont. And I mean, what a beautiful story. It's small town, it's Vermont. They're creating a national product. They're using the earth and natural bee honey. And who, who would have thought about honey and gin? I certainly wouldn't have. And uh, so we're, we're always looking for those interesting food stories, whether it's about like what you're talking about, artisanal food, that you're know, going to the land and growing your own stuff, that whole Alice Waters, you know, Shea Panisse, beautiful movement, or just people who are doing something interesting with food. We are super interested in hearing about it. I've got a staff of great freelance writers. And, you know, that, that's, that's so important. I think our relationship with food is, with this pandemic, I hope coming to an end, it's going to change a little bit in a lot of different ways. Some good, maybe some not so good. But people are going to find a way, I believe. I mean, what, what knits us together more than food in any culture, wherever you go? Uh, I am... Um, I traveled the world as a speechwriter for, well, really, I, I still do, but not recently, but, you know, for 25 years. And the most beautiful experience is I always, I always think of a trip to the Emirates. I, it was probably Dubai yeah. when I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And the hosts picked us up and they took us to their home after 22 hours of flying. And we had this magnificent meal. Um, nothing breaks the ground nicer than that to sit with your hosts and have a meal at their home and see their kids and their family before you put on a suit and tie back when we wore suits and ties and uh, started our work. So yeah, I, this is changing times, but I'm hoping we hit rock bottom and that there's going to be opportunity. We have on that. And then talking about bees. So Savannah bees out of, uh, out of Georgia is uh, we're going to have three dozen bees on our property because here's the thing. We need bees without trees, which we have plenty of trees on out of the 542 acres. We only use 36. The rest of them stay the way they, they, it is. And it's all sort of like a tiny house type of setting. At one point we were gonna have 55 tiny houses and we had to scale it back to have only 25 because you have to always be able to adapt and adjust to, to this new change. And if you can't do that, you will either lose your life and your business, if not both. And I've been telling people that since October 3rd of 2018, and I will always tell them on our platforms because I want people to survive. I want them to say, these are, these are, these are people to look out for. Look to see what they're doing. They've gotten creative. You know, uh, when, you know yeah, by, by, 20, by June 18th of 2019, we only had 2 million views. April 16th, that same year, I had 1 million views. We're at 7 million views a day and counting. I figured it out. If my note, another show comes up between now and let's say the next month out of Tennessee, I'll get to my 10 million views a day because of the, the numbers move that quickly. However, the reason I'm saying all these things is because we built it all up like this to find people like yourself to include, to talk about, because what you guys have created is important. People are going to want to go out and, and get something because you can't get it on an airline now. There aren't any conventions for still for a little while, unless you're in Florida, unless you're in Texas, not right. in the States. So also that doesn't mean it's safe per se, but at the same time, we still have to do stuff like that. Even if I'm gonna order food in our studio, I gotta make sure it, one, it's healthy, but two, it's handled the right way. And so it's a challenging and you know about these things. Talk mm -hmm. about that aspect of how to handle stuff now of deliveries. Boy, that is a loaded topic, isn't it? Because a lot of these delivery companies, and I won't name names, are being challenged on what percentage they take when they're making their deliveries. Um, one of the things I'm finding an interesting business that I think is relating to what you're talking to here is the catering business, which is really the takeout business. Um, we've done a bunch of stories at Beyondish 
about um, uh, someone created a lasagna business that's gone national. I can't come up with their name right now. And there is some element of trust there. Um, I mean, there are some regulations. I, I, I'm not someone who can quote those regulations for you. I write about the food business, but I'm, I'm not literally in it like that. But um, I think people treat the food they're serving up and delivering the way they would treat their own children or their loved ones, right? So if, if you're baking cookies or you're, you're doing lasagna, we, we had a guy doing a pizza delivery out of his window at University of Pennsylvania, started it as a charity just to help people in need. And then it, it became a popular business. He was making the pizzas in his apartment and lowering them out the window in a bucket and you send your money up. Uh, there's another guy, one of my favorite stories, another one who lost his job and started baking bread in upstate New York or northern north of the city. And he started, he got a big old fashioned jelly cat, one of those big things, wooden, you know, that you can put about, I would guess, a hundred loaves of bread in. He would uh, bake in his garage, as I recall. Then he'd go out in his pickup truck, hide the cabinet, the jelly cabinet in the woods, leave a couple of hundred loaves. And then on his Instagram and Facebook, he'd post clues to where the food was. So part one, you got to trust the guy. It's not Wonder Bread. It's not in a sealed USDA package. People would come and, and the cost to the people, first of all, they loved looking for the bread. He sold out every single day. I'm sure he still is. And wow. there's just a note on the side, leave whatever you can. So if you're hungry and you're on Instagram and in need, you go get yourself a nice you know, loaf of bread, a panini or whatever. Uh, but people supported them. You leave five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever you thought it was worth. So all the different pieces came together, the social media, the baking, the ways to come around if you've lost your, your means of employ and, and you're providing food to the community, which is so darned important. Well, I would always say to people, I call that the Bernie Sanders effect. No matter what it is, it all adds up and something is better than nothing. And I always tell people that's that's a good thing because this is where you have to get creative, you be adaptable, you know, be able to adjust, being able to adapt. And those are great stories. That's something like the Italians you would see them probably do. But you know what? Anybody can do it. Anybody. I mean, who thought? And I kind of knew this was coming, but who thought everybody would be in, in their home doing a podcast or a radio show or a television and mixing it up all together? Yep. Going away. You think this will stay? You think people are still going to be doing this from home after we... Uh... Oh, absolutely, because it cuts down on everything. I use Disney as an example. But all the buildings that they have in a lot that have been empty and the billions of dollars that they went through last year, I called them on this a couple of years ago and I was warning theaters. I was warning um, uh, real theaters out of Tennessee, our biggest numbers, 4 million plus a day and counting out of Tennessee. I was trying to help them. Uh, Bob and Greg Lindley, who are friends of mine, Lemley Theater is the oldest mom and pop in, in the end. I was telling them, I want to help you change your things around. There's something coming that you guys won't be prepared of. So that's why everybody started coming to us because we can see what other people can't see. We've already adapted to what people are doing now. We did it in 2018. I sent out the very first email October 3rd of 2018 when I was on the East Coast in Georgia where my mom was. I saw things changing and I said, this is all going to change. They have no idea what's going to happen that she lives in an enclave, sort of like a Sun, Sun City, Peachtree, Arizona, a state, 1,500 100, 100 people there, but you, you are ages 55 to 86. So I saw what was happening with that age demo. They all knew what I was doing. Some of them thought I was crazy. They all pay attention to me now. I can yeah. do that. Experience will do that for you. And I remember the Lemley theaters. I used to go see art films in Santa Monica at those theaters when I lived out in California all the time. They were a quality operation they wrote they always screened the best movies i don't i haven't been there in a while i'm still helping a lot of those filmmakers they've all become friends the musicians and everything except now they're starting to do all their own podcasts and i go let's see how long you can do this for because this is not a one and done just because you had a year of changing things this is a benefit to you because you can reach a whole audience that i might not be reaching even though i am but it's the other way around. I'm reaching audiences that you could never reach because of our numbers, if that makes sense. And yeah, no, it really does. It, think of Joe Rogan. And, and I didn't know who Joe Rogan was until I saw the history of the comedy store on Showtime. I'm like, oh, this is Joe Rogan. I was thinking of another Joe Rogan in the sports world. 
He started his podcast in 09. He's the number one guy in the world. You'll never be able to catch him. I only go by views. He goes by subscribers and his weekly stuff. So my stuff is daily and weekly, but I don't go by followers because you can always unfollow. I don't go by likes because you can always unlike something five minutes later. And I don't go by subscribers because you can subscribe and then 30 days later, you don't want to subscribe anymore. So I go by what you can tangibly see. And as the old newspaper guy, you can understand that when people are actually buying the physical copies. It's like that. I still buy the New York Times every day and read it in print, you know, of all the things that have changed in our life. Uh, and the day will probably come when we won't get it in print. But I, I value that and cherish that, that 60 minutes. And, you know, it also makes you slow down and think. Yeah. Uh, you know, much like any other medium you use, you know, um, I listen to a lot of jazz. When I get home at night, the phone goes away. I have an old Pioneer SX550 receiver. I still pick up a real book put on WBGO FM in New Jersey with, yeah. with the dial, and, you know, the static coming in and out. But also, I mean, a, a lot of the, the origins of Beyondish was I've driven every back road in America. You'd be hard pressed to find one I haven't been on. And that, that's so palpable, the people you meet. And, and, but, but whether you're listening to a podcast or the old CBS theater or the minor league baseball on the radio, but when you're out there with the window down and the window open, it's real. Uh, real and genuine, which I guess if we had it, any model at the company I'm running now, that this thing I've founded, just being organic and real and genuine. I mean, obviously you got to pay attention to the numbers and your reach and who's paying attention and the analytics. But I, I, you know, you can analyze to kingdom come, but are people getting some value and a little enjoyment out of what you do? That, that's, that's what keeps them coming back in my humble opinion. You know, the, you know, you, you mentioned numbers. The only reason I was mentioning numbers is because the publicists or the companies would say, oh, I can't see where you have a million views. Oh, really? So I had to, I had, not only do I guide people, I actually had to lead them to where they needed to go. I'm like, see this show in Tennessee? It's got 1.1, 1 .1, 159,000 views, 723, and still moving. Just in Tennessee, that show is not on YouTube. That's just Tennessee, but around the world, but not on YouTube. Because YouTube, they don't think about this. It's not in every country. It's not in the country of Argentina where we have some of our biggest numbers. Mm -hmm. And not only do we have one show, we have another show that's at 1.1 million views. I took the author, because uh, she was a five-time cancer survivor from the Elvis Presley brand. Her Elvis was her cousin. She's the one who used to make Elvis's sandwiches. She runs that whole thing. St. Jude's Hospital, the Grand Ole Opry, Dolly World, Graceland, we're all part of that now because we went there. So you remember the days when you would take a show or a film and screen it in a small town, like you were talking about? Yep. That's what we did. We didn't go to Nashville. We went to Franklin, Tennessee, built up a green screen, August 4th to 2018. Everything for us happened in 2018. Because remember, I said I, we saw things coming. And those shows, we got one show is at 827,000 views. So between now and the end of the year, that will get to 900,000. We have another one that's at 856,000 between now and let's say May 1st, that will be at 900,000. And then we have four others, or two others at a million one each. That's just in Tennessee. That doesn't count my YouTube channel. That doesn't count my Tuesday night shows. You get the picture, put it all. Yeah, absolutely. It, it makes yeah. sense. So when it's I take someone part. like what, when I take someone like what you have, I like what you have to offer. That's fun to share that. And then you have a whole nother awesome. So it's almost like we're kind of do, helping to do the work because we may not be able to reach those back roads right now yet, as you like talking about, because I love to do that too. You know, so what, this is what we have to do. We got to put it out there like a spider web. And that's, you know, the, the, that's where I think we're going to end up for the, the foreseeable, let's say the next three to six months. Um, we're going to be doing some live events, but I think we're going to, and I think we're going to start in Charleston, South Carolina. I think great food, great people. It's not big and you know so so big you can't wrap your arms around it. And uh, if our first Beyondish events bring together a half dozen chefs and fifty people who enjoy shrimp and grits, and uh, we can do a little good there. And you know, out of Charleston, maybe that'll lead to two or three other cities in South Carolina. I'm a patient guy. I've been driving these roads. I did that first trip when I was 16 with my best friend. I'm still doing it. My last trip before the pandemic was uh, I flew out to Bozeman, Montana in August, a year, not this last August, the year before, drove 2,000 miles wow. across Montana, North Dakota, 
just in a rental car. I'm a New Yorker. I don't own a car. New Yorkers don't own cars. I just, I just pick a place and I, I'm a big supporter of a, a company no one thinks about anymore, Rand McNally. I, I oh, do not GPS yes. my way across the high road of Montana. I've got seven, I think. My kids will tell you, can tell you this. Just old crumpled Rand McNally's and you open up the map, and you look for the smallest squiggly little line and you say, oh, there are a few towns on there. I'm gonna go drive through them and see what's going on. And I think that's where you find some of the, just the greatest people in this country. And they all have a story to tell and inevitably it's about food. Well, it was the same thing if you saw the movie Green Book on PBS, there is actually that Green Book, which was the black version of the Rand McNally. And that's an interesting story because yep. they kind of connect on how they started. You know, you take the guy who mm -hmm. fish out of New York, he ends up t believing in this, this black guy and they ended up picking dots around the country. So it was almost like the underground that you could go across country that people of African-American or people of color would follow. And it was very interesting. So absolutely, I was a fan of that too. That was a good movie. Didn't that win an Oscar? But did that win the Oscar last well, year? Well, yeah, uh, uh, Masisha Ali, he ended up winning an Oscar in the Green Book. Yeah, and that was my choice to win that year because, it, you know, like I said, it was educational. You know, it was exciting to watch. It was in, in entertaining and it's emotional and based on a true story. I love stuff like that. Likewise, that's the kind of movies I go to. And uh, the movie theaters are just opening up again here in New York. That's one of those things I, I will really look forward to again, um, other than going to the gym one of these days. Uh, I always used to do movie lunches because, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're allowed to put down your stuff at noon on a rainy or a snowy afternoon. We got a gazillion movie theaters here, art houses. You can go see an obscure French film between yeah. noon and two in New York. I, I call them the blue haired lady specials because you inevitably have a, a senior citizen crowd there. <laughs> they occasionally tend to talk through the movies, but we just tune that out. And uh, it's just fabulous. I love those small movies. Well, I, I, I'm a movie whore, so the, the, the tough thing for me was not being able to go to the movie, even though I was prepared for it, and not get my popcorn and sit in the corner and just be able to just turn my phone around, even though it's ringing and vibrating and people are trying to reach me, just at least for two hours, I can just think because I get ideas coming to me when I'm watching movies. That was the hardest thing for me. And then now I'm okay with it now, but it took a, it took a long time because I'm not ready to go back to the theaters and neither are a lot of people because it wasn't ready. And now it's sort of like an obstacle course of which you have to go through. You can just go get your concessions and then go and sit. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and they're going to take your temperature. I, actually, they're not allowed. I've not been back to the movies. I also, I, yeah, my theory on all this stuff is we've come this far, knock on wood, I'm going to be patient till it's really, you know, and it's not just for me, it's for everyone. You Absolutely. Know, we we, we got to we got to be sensible here, but boy, I'm, I am with you. And I, I do get, uh, I, I tell my wife, I call this my thinking time. When I go to a movie, I actually silence the phone. And when it's over, I, I usually like to be alone for about a half hour. Uh, it's like stealth thinking. You go to see some French foreign film and you have a great idea for your business or maybe something you want to do with your kid or your, your loved one or whatever. You know, it's, a, it's a beautiful escape. And I never eat before the movie. I always eat afterwards because I don't want to feel sluggish when I'm at the movie theater. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I always did that too. See, I can't go with a, with a group of people because they all take their time. And then by the time they're ready, I would have already seen a movie at that point. I would be on the <laughs> So, and I'm used to going early in the morning. I'd like to go at 10 so I could be done by noon. And then they started moving the times an hour, hour and a half back. I'm like, this is not fair because... I would always be there with a lot of the, the older Jewish uh, ladies and I would sit with them because they were funny to listen to. And they go, well, what are you doing here, young man? I'm like, oh, I missed my screening for this. So I'm actually going to pay to see this movie. But sometimes I would have a ticket. So I always talked about what it's like to still pay to go to certain theaters, what it's like to be that movie critic who could see it for free or I got the link because it's still about telling people to go to this theater to support this film of all the people who worked on it. Same thing with the book. I love the hard copy. And, you know, you talked about buying, the, you know, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Uh, I was I was always buying USA Today and Variety and Reporter. That was my mm -hmm. that was my Starbucks. That added up to about seven dollars. And I'm like, oh, I can't keep doing this every day after a while because it adds up after a while. But I did it for like almost yep. half years. 
you know, it's what we value. And now they get you with the subscriber fees, but uh, I, I hope they keep printing the books and going to them. They're, they're very, very important. You know, it's also about community. Uh, very hard to pick a book scrolling through your phone. Uh, we have a bookstore here. I'm sure you know it in New York called The Strand. Yeah. And uh, it's been around forever. And uh, to me, that's an event. Going to The Strand to look for an old used paperback. It just is a beautiful thing to do. Well, it's almost like Amoeba Records in Los Angeles was the place where I would always tell a lot of younger kids, go and get your vinyl there because vinyl is what everybody's got. Uh, you'll like this. So on Hulu and NetGeo, uh, Aretha Franklin is called Genius. If you haven't seen it, you'll like that because where does she come out of? R&B, jazz, soul. And then she hooks up with, with that eventually a Clive Davis. It's very interesting. What they sent me, which I really liked, was they sent me a record player with a Bluetooth in it, with it's got Genius Aretha on it, and they sent me an album. That was like one of nice. the gifts I got this, this year. And I was like, I, so I'm showing everybody, I'm like, this is great. And I'm like, this is what kids love because they, as you and I both grew up in vinyl, they love vinyl too. My kids both love vinyl and uh, both my kids are actually on the radio now. Um, one does a radio show at college up at University of Vermont. And the other one does a sports show, kind of like, you know, from his right now, he just graduated. He and his friend that called Second Floor Sports. They talk sports for two hours, call in and they interview people. So they're all adapting, but my kids love vinyl. And you just reminded me, this is totally out of the blue of the, when I lived in LA, going down to Tower Records on Sunset. Was that an afternoon? Was that just a pleasure to wander through Tower Records? If I, if I could bring anything back, it might be that. Well, I worked at Tower Video, so imagine every celebrity who came into Tower Video, which was across the street from there. So my my mm -hmm. reason now, I didn't know this, I remember signing up William Broad, who was Billy Idol, <laughs> and I remember him oh, I didn't know that. in the old VHS days, and he came in with sunglasses. He goes, mate, can you sign me up real quick? I don't want anybody to know who I am. And I'm looking like this, I'm like, well, who are you? And I just remember William Broad, and I look up, oh, it's Billy Idol. Sure, Billy, yeah, I'll get you in and out of there. And then Danny, the, <laughs> he would come in, he would buy $1,500 with the laser disc, if you remember those, because he I do there for, for being as the penguin, he would watch them backwards in the mirror. And I never forgot that. Who knew, knew years later, they would all be friends of mine. Who knew? And so I remind them. And then here's another one you'll like. It's called The Last Blockbuster. And, uh, and it's on Netflix of what that was like, because here we are coming back to these things of helping the last video store. Even Mieber is coming back in a different place and because vinyl is outselling CDs and everything else, but people want to get back in and actually touch things like a regular book. And that's why I've been talking to a lot of the authors because there's nothing like picking up that book and being able to show people the hard copy of stuff. And I love to do that. Just read a beautiful book called La Chef. It's a French translation. And to your point about actually touching a book, and, and you and I, we both, we review, and we're, 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 we're in the field where we're cognizant of things going on around us. This book was so beautifully written. I was reading passages to my wife in the middle of the night. I couldn't put it down. But the payoff wasn't until the very last page. So was it a good book or was it not? It was beautifully executed and beautifully written. And to me, that experience is you just didn't know where it was going. It wasn't a huge book, a couple of hundred pages, but to keep turning those dog-eared pages, right? I bought it used. And you get to the last page, you're like, wow, like at the end of the movie. And I always stay till the end credit roll because I used to be a filmmaker. And, you know, someone's kid was the gaffer. So they, they deserved to have their credits watched too. And uh, the, these, these palpable cultural food movie experiences are just, just we need them. Maybe that's the lesson of all this lockdown is we miss touching things. It is. And that's what I tell people. Uh, and I, I specifically tell these kids because my friends, uh, friends that I grew up with now, they're, they're sending me their sons and daughters. And I'm like, well, this is strange. <laughs> and I didn't see this one come out. But, you know, it's an honor because you don't want to have anything happen because they're trusting in you. They don't say this, but that's how I take it. They're sending me you, you, their kids. So I'm telling them. When you're watching a movie, stay toward the end credits because you could get your future job by looking at the casting, where it was shot. If you, you know, the voiceovers, ADR, because I do voiceovers, and I was like, 
you want to see, you can get your future job and people don't pay attention to that. Always do that. And they go, oh, I didn't think about that. I'm like, no, no one's telling you, but I'm telling you, this is how you can get your other jobs. You got to think outside the box. I always tell people I'm hovering above the box so I can see all yeah. things like this. I'm with you on that. Uh, we got a couple minutes left. Talk about this because this is, this is going to be weird still. When you went and did Oprah's show or any of these talk shows like this, they're changed. They're not the same. How do you, in your point of view, how do you see the world of marketing, whether it's beyond this, the books and stuff that as you wrote as a screenwriter and as an author, how do you see that world now from your point of view? Wow, that, that is just a fabulous question. And uh, you know that, that old cliche question, what keeps you up at night? We're figuring it out. I'll come back to that word organic. Um, I mean, yeah, we have publicists and we have marketing people and we have social media. At this early stage, as we're just rolling out our business and just starting to grow, I come back to what my kids taught me when I first got on Instagram. Uh, two lessons. The first one was nobody remembers what you did one microsecond after you post it. So you kind of can't screw up. You know, I, I was sitting there spending an hour on one picture. I said, Dad, just post the darn picture and move on. And, uh, and it's true. Who looks back on their Instagram feed to see what someone posted three weeks ago? No one. Uh, the other thing, and it is, I guess it is my favorite word, forgive me for repeating it several times today, is being genuine. You have brilliant marketing executives, but then look at some of these companies, you know, I'm not going to name names, these multi-billion dollar unicorn companies, they haven't made a profit in nine years, but right. everybody knows their first name. Uh, I did not get into Beyondish to get rich. I, I would love to buy a house in Vermont someday. I did it because I'm at a place in my career where I needed to combine everything I love, food, travel, people. And I thought, you know, a lot of people are, are starting digital platforms and they're, they're making a living at it. So can I. And I think the success will come from being genuine. And that's what I ask myself. I'm, I'm a morning person. I'm also a night person, but that's a different subject. But I, I skip to the subway every day because, you know, the ideas I have generally come from the heart. And then you turn to smart people who are smarter than me, if I've learned anything running your own business, listen to the people who are smarter than you because they, they have good ideas. I do not know everything. Please tell your audience, I do not know everything. I, I know what works. I know it's delicious. I know a good picture, I think, when I see it. I certainly know good writing. And then you feed that to the people who have expertise in other areas, analytics, marketing, publicity, and and. You know, I, I listen to them and trust them. And I'm here because someone told me about you and you're kind enough to offer me this chance to hold forth with you for an hour, however long we've been on. I haven't looked at the clock. That's trust, right? Well, I said, I'm a nice person and they're, they're, you have a nice conversation. And I said, OK, I'm, I'm down with that. Well, one of the things I, I learned by doing in-person junkets, one on one, I, I mean, we'll never get, be able to talk to a Sean Connery a lot of these people, these icons, you can't talk to them. One, some of them have passed away, but the other thing is they are of age and they are very particular. Uh, you may not be able to get together in a room with them for a long time, if ever again, because of this, this is not going away. And that's what I tell people. So each time I hear someone who's passing away, I'm like, ah, oh, it's a good thing for my studio that it's, that it's small, it's private, it's new. We built it during COVID and it was never shut down because we kept it small. We take your temperatures when you come in. We can pull our microphones out. You can wear your mask. You can wear your shield. And people like it because they didn't expect it to be open air. And that's how you have to do it for one. And then the other thing is I, I, I always say, if you're the smartest one in the room, you're in the wrong room. So I like yeah. to get into all different types of rooms because I'm telling you what I know, but tell me something that matches that I don't know. And let's see where the science and everything is because it's our job to tell the correct news. That's a lost art. And that's a whole nother story, isn't it? We'll have to do another hour, but I love what you just said about the room. I will, I will quote you on that extensively. <laughs> and uh, my, my sort of catchphrase, and I, I, just, I just make this stuff up off the top of my head. I, you know, not some business maven, but uh, I love to hear everyone's bad ideas. I, I think there's so much to learn, and, including mine. 
the worse the idea, the better. How many times have you heard a bad idea that becomes a fantastic idea? Uh, people try too hard to be perfect and they save it all up for one thing. When we sit down and like yourself, it's all been by Zoom and conference calls, what have you. It's like, bring me your worst ideas. Let's spend an hour and shoot it all out there. Because out of that, if we come up with one good one, one actionable one, we win. Everyone wins. Well, the bad ideas are always turned into good ideas. And then the things that's impossible, it, it becomes possible. You just have to have those people in different rooms come together in a big room. Now in a smaller room in a different way, they could still be done. I always tell everybody, Apple started out of the garage. So did Microsoft, all these other things. You know, we started out, we, we are our first show outside of Los Angeles started in a garage. We built it up the night before, you know, the story about that. I had a cop stop me because I was walking to build up the stuff because my friend had had a heart attack. He goes, where are you walking to? I'm going, I'm walking to my friend's house. He, want, he goes, do you want to ride? And I go, what cop asked the black guy, does he want to ride in the state, <laughs> in a different state? Yeah. No, I have already walked 40 minutes. He's just down the street. He goes, sure you don't want to ride? I'm like, why is this cop asking me about a ride? Again, all 2018. Until this day, and I asked my white friends, uh, would you have gotten into this, to this cop car? Was I going to sit in the front? Was I going to sit in the back? And if I sat in the back and I said, yes, would I have ever been seen again? The reason I didn't, the real reason I didn't get in, because the next day we were shooting six shows. Those six shows are the ones, uh, four out of the six are the ones, uh, one, one's got 1.1 million going, the other two have 826, the other one's 857 is still counting. What would have happened if I didn't do those shows the next day? That was in my mind. It's all about the moment. I, I keep track of those. You know, every, everything turns on a dime, every decision all of that stuff. And uh, um, I had just written a ghost written a book for someone uh, two years ago, uh, I guess 2019. Wasn't a terrific experience. And I was real low after that moment. It comes and goes like every corporate experience. Had I not had that poor experience, I never would have started beyond this. I had to kind of get to a place where I said, this, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of writing books like that. And so, you know, I had a little bit of a low period and like, you're not getting in the back of that car, you know, the next day something happened that let, you know, one moment led to my being here today, talking to you with this, you know, absolutely. And one that's moment. why I always go back to, you know, May of 2018, when I tell people I picked Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and I actually won two bets and I don't even gamble. And they go, you're nuts. I'm like, yeah, but I know what I'm talking about. So Let's see how everything unfolds because you have to wait till everything unfolds. And I tell people it's a marathon, not a sprint, no matter what you're building up. As long as you can just see it through, you never know what will be happening the next day, as you just said. You just don't know. It takes that bad experience to, to turn it into a positive or a good experience. Uh, so I, I tell people all the time it is a marathon. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Ken, give your social media links for everybody. Um, beyondish.com come and review for us uh, foodformarriage.com you'll find all my personal writing and uh, my Instagram is also at foodformarriage and I have a one other funny Instagram called Mrs. Wagner's Pies like the line from the Simon and Garfunkel song where I document all my favorite American pictures so, so we bought a pack of cigarettes and Mrs. Wagner's Pies and all came to look for America uh, so any of those, you'll find the whole scoop. I think that's great. Well, it's an honor to over there that, you know, to talk to you. This is not the last time you and I will be talking because I already got plans in my mind for how to incorporate everything. I already know. <laughs> and it's one of those. It, it would be my pleasure. And I will throw it right back at you. You're obviously a, a person who travels and knows the world. Come next time you have a dish that you must talk about. Get out your phone or your laptop, write three sentences, come review a dish for us, have a little fun. It's really fun. Pick a place where you care about the people who are cooking that food. And I know the editor-in-chief pretty well. I bet that dish will get on the site. <laughs> I'll do that because I love stuff like that. I like finding those, those iconic or uh, eclectic places that people don't think of. I love doing that. And then they look at me strange. I'm like, do you have a business card? Uh, no. I'm like, you need one. This is a great place. You just never know who's going to come here and want to talk about it. And then so it gets their head rolled. 
I love doing stuff like that. And then a month later, they're like, oh, you're the guy who turned everybody on this. I'm like, yeah, this is a great place. Don't you want business? <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing you pop up on our queue. That'll be awesome, Brian. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Ken, it's been an honor and pleasure to, to meet you. And like I said, this won't be the last time. You'll be coming to our Dream Weaver Artist Ranch in Redding, California. You'll be sitting down at one of our tiny restaurants, our tiny brewery, and seeing the 10 acres that we're planning there. This is going to be, this is perfect for you. And I have a feeling your stuff will be on the Art to Montague. I think uh, we could tie it into that because it just makes sense. It's got a great outside presence outside the U.S. of things. And I leave everybody with this. If you see someone without a smile, please give them one of yours because the world needs it. I'm Brian Sebastian. This is Movie Reviews More. And we will see you next time.